Recording. All right. So welcome everyone, and thanks for joining us again for uh, Tuesday night training with uh, uh, CSRD Fire Services. And uh, today we're going to be doing a course on uh, basically it's emergency service uh, scene management and the first arriving officer. So talking about your roles and responsibilities if you're in that officer chair and you find yourself as the first arriving officer at a structure fire call. So who is the first arriving officer? Uh, anybody who's been in, our, in, in the departments for long enough, you know that the, fir the first arriving officer is that person who's gonna be in the front passenger seat of the first arriving apparatus. That person might not have an officer rank, right? But they should be an experienced firefighter. If you're going to take a passenger seat in one of the apparatus, just understand your role is the officer of that apparatus. You're going to be responsible for a number of things. The radio communications, you're, all, you're as responsible as the driver to ensure the safe operation of that vehicle. Uh, but another thing that you have is you're going to be also responsible for, uh, for if you're in the first truck that arrives on scene, you're going to be the one who's going to assume command likely at the fire call, be the first one to assume command. So today what we're going to do is we're going to discuss the sequence of actions that that first arriving officer should follow to ensure that they have an effective response. I don't know why this is coming up here. It's going to move these over here guys. Sorry. So Today we're going to be discussing those actions that the first responding officer takes from the time the call drops. The first time we can receive the call uh, to, the, to, the, to the time um, the, the commander has uh, developed their incident action plan. All right. So we're going to talk about a few different topics. We're going to talk about in, uh, basically in the initial size up actions and the report that needs to be given. We're going to talk about giving a 360 uh, size up. And we're also going to talk about some other considerations that come into the, uh, to the, the incident commander's way of thinking and things that we need to consider when we're out there. So again, the first arriving officer, the fire, he's the firefighter who is in that passenger seat of the first arriving apparatus. They may be an officer by rank, or they may be an experienced firefighter. Whoever they are, if you're going to jump in that seat, you need to have the training and you need to have something behind you to be to enable yourself to take on the role of incident commander. We have a lot of great courses that go into a lot more depth on this topic. We have our strategies and tactics course will we'll, uh, teach you about this a lot. Our live fire three course, our team leader course, all of which will put command boards in your hand and let you operate, you know, either in a tabletop manner or uh, at the burn building with actual, you know, moving teams, uh, deploying the troops, getting an incident action plan together, running the accountability board. So I really uh, highly uh, advise everyone here, you know, as you move on through the ranks, as you get more experience, as you pass your exterior operations, your interior operations, go for your team leader and, and keep learning more about the strategies and tactics that are needed to fight fires because any one of us, you know, in the paid on call system could find ourselves in that chair at some given time. How many times do we arrive at the hall? We're the, you know, we're the only one there and we ask for a repage. How many times do we arrive at the hall and there's a very few, a very small number of us there and we're waiting for some experienced officer to show up? It happens to all of us. It happens in all uh, fire departments, paid on calls especially. All right, so first we're gonna start talking about the on-scene report, all right? There's, a certain, uh, there's certain information that needs to be provided to dispatch within our first transmission, all right? <clears throat> we need to let them know we're on scene. We've made it here, right? We need to confirm that the address that they sent us to is the, uh, is the accurate address as well, all right? We need to establish command. We need to tell them the building type and occupancy. We need to talk about building size. We need to talk about the conditions that we've seen. This is also known as a windshield size up. We also want to give them our initial strategic or operational mode that we're going to be going into and we're going to talk about what our initial actions are so that not only dispatch hears all of this, also any incoming units behind are going to hear this. I'm going to hear this because on major structure fire calls I'm on my way and I rely on this communication 
to get to get a sense of what I'm going to. I'm responding code three. I'm going possibly a long distance, whether it's to Swansea Point, to Angelmont, to Falkland, wherever I'm going, it's going to be a bit of a drive from Salmon Arm, and I'm going to be going code three. R raises the danger level. This first transmission really gives me a sense of, is there a sense of urgency I need to have to get out there, or can I maybe respond in a more routine manner? All right, this first transmission is vital. It's often overlooked, right? So another big part of why it's vital is because it sets what's, it, it has a number of things that help us benchmark uh, specific actions. And we'll talk about benchmarks a little bit more as I go on, all right? And those benchmarks become part of the official record. All right, so our on-scene report. We've gotten in our fire truck. We've, you know, we were the first, we we're in the passenger seat of the of the apparatus. We're heading out to the call. We've let dispatch know we're responding with however many are in our apparatus. We get on the scene. <clears throat> we need to give our first on scene report. All right. Here's here are the different things that we need to include in that on scene report. All right. And and the first thing is to announce that we are on scene and confirm the address. All right. Um, this is what's known as a benchmark, and I talked about that. The time you arrived on scene is now a part of that official record. Uh, so anytime we, if we need to go back to the official dispatch log, find out what happened at that call, it is all time stamped on, in terms of what time apparatus left the, uh, left the hall, what time they arrived on scene, and all these, and a number of other important factors should be benchmarked as we go along. Communicating with dispatch isn't just to let dispatch know, right? It's not like there's somebody sitting in a dispatch station going, wow, I'm really glad to know they're on scene right now. This becomes part of the official record and can't be overlooked, all right? This is absolutely vital, right? We, confirm, we also wanna confirm the address to ensure the accuracy of the dispatch log, all right? This is something that often gets overlooked. Uh, callers are known to give wrong addresses all the time, right? It's our responsibility to make sure that the correct address is recorded and is a part of the official record of this call. Um, it's also important for incoming crews, including mutual aid partners, other emergency responders, other utility companies that are coming en route, they need to know where they're going. If we give them the wrong address, it can be difficult for them to find it, if not impossible, you know, depending on whether they can find the address we're telling them uh, in Google Maps, right? So uh, an example of this type of communication, again, I've arrived on scene, I'm the first arriving officer, basically the way I would communicate this information is Eagle Bay, you know, let's say I'm Eagle Bay Fire, from Eagle Bay Engine 1 on scene, confirming the address 1234 Main Street. All right, uh, if it's not the right address, you can be Eagle Bay Engine 1 on scene, revised address is 1236 Main Street. That way, the official log is going to be updated. You're going to have the right address on it. Again, not something to be overlooked. And I can tell you, I've had a couple of instances in some recent calls where we have had issues with the address after the fact. And sometimes it can be very difficult for us on scene to confirm addresses, you know, and, and there are some good programs out there with uh, the first responders, uh, they sell shoe swap first responders, they sell uh, um, kind of reflective uh, address signs. It's a great one to pump up through your own social media to try and get people to uh, make sure that they're uh, posting their address in a way that we can see it. Uh, but we should be looking for that. We should be trying to confirm it because if we don't, what ends up happening is I've submitted a fire report now into the office of the fire commissioner. I need to go back and correct the record. After 72 hours, I need to contact the commissioner's office and let them know that they need to make a change to the record. So we need to make sure we're doing this. We're accurate as we go so that we don't have to follow up afterwards. So the next part of the on-scene report is going to be we need to let, is that we need to let dispatch know uh, basically uh, who is going to be in command, who is taking control of this situation, right? The first arriving officer is going to have two choices. The first one is going to is that they can assume command, and the second choice that they have is that they can pass command to the next arriving unit. All right. So again, I titled this uh, the, the first arriving officer. There is an out for that first arriving officer, and that's called the pass com passing of command. This is something I don't I, I don't like to see very often, honestly. I, I I prefer it if that first arriving officer does take command. All right, and and really do the best you can at it. Uh, you can always pass command and transfer command at a later time, right? Um, but if the firefighter chooses to pass command, the next arriving officer must 
assume command. So the next person coming in an apparatus behind in that, in that uh, passenger seat must assume command. They cannot pass it to the third arriving apparatus, all right? Uh, so you're basically tying the hands of the next, uh, next arriving officer that they are going to have to take command. And you're really passing the buck in that situation. You're first on scene, take the time, do your size up, get a sense of what's going on and provide this information to dispatch so that incoming units know what's going on. And if we set up command in a good way to start, the entire scene is gonna go much smoother, all right? Um, and again, remember, uh, we can transfer command. Um, if a higher ranking officer arrives on scene at a later time, if somebody with more experience in incident command and some, you know, and, and the specific situation you're dealing with arrives on scene, there is a possibility to transfer command. You learn how to do that in, you know, in your strategies and tactics courses, in your live fire three courses. Uh, there is a talk about that as well. Uh, that needs to be broadcast. You need to say that, you know, we're transferring command to so-and-so. Uh, that person will need to do their own 360 and uh, evaluate the property. Um, but again, take the opportunity, establish command, do your best at it, all right? And give you a bit, a bit of an example of what this is going to sound like. So again, we're going to transmit the message for everybody to hear. We want them to know who's in command, right? So we're going to say, you know, let's say Eagle Bay Firefighter 403, assuming command. You're then going to name your command, all right? And the ne so naming a command is is necessary because there might be multiple fire calls that our dispatch is dealing with. We go with Surrey Fire Dispatch. They oversee numerous fire departments. Uh, the biggest chunk is from the CSRD for sure. Uh, but as you know, we don't call them Surrey Dispatch. We'll call them Eagle Bay Dispatch, we'll Malakwa Dispatch, Tap and Sunny Bray Dispatch. So. Um, but that's so that they can hear it and know which units are calling and answer back on the right frequency. Uh, they also want to know which command is calling them. So we need to name the command. It can be named for a geographical location. Uh, for example, we can call it, uh, we'll call this Eagle Bay command uh, is one option, right? And that's the one I most often see. Uh, you know, the, the department's just going to call it by the name of the department. Uh, but the geographical designation is another option, and that'll come in handy if you find your department responding to multiple calls. Um, so you can call, you can say, well, we'll call this Main Street Command. All right, that's another way of saying, and that's what I'm talking about with geographical, right? Talk, just name it after the street you're working on. All right, it can be Squadlocks Anglemont Command, however, or <laughs> whatever, whatever street you're working on at that time. The next step of our initial on-scene report is going to be to broadcast the building type and occupancy of that building. Uh, this is based on the five types of construction that you learn about in your building construction component of exterior operations firefighter training. All right, so you know, I hope a lot of you have done your building construction now. Uh, does everybody remember what they're seeing up here with the type one, two, three, four, five? Um, and again, just briefly to go through it, type one, it's fire resistive. It has something on it that's going to prevent fire from spreading. And you can see the spray insulation that's on there right now. That's a fire retardant, prevents flames, prevents fire from growing. Type two is non-combustible, made of just steel and non-combustible materials. Type three is called ordinary construction, typically a brick facade over some type of either lathe and plaster or other, or, or, uh, or other type of, uh, uh, of uh, building construction behind it. Um, type five, or type four, sorry, is heavy timber. And when we talk about heavy timber, we're not just talking about the facade. We're also, we're talking about what, uh, about the supports. And you can see the, the large diameter uh, wood that's being used as joists uh in the building that i have on the screen here and type five is the most typical we're going to come across and that's wood frame all right <clears throat> so i'm hearing somebody coming through and i don't know who that is make sure you got your uh that you guys are muted all right so then we also talk about the occupancy, and the occupancy is in regards to what the building is used for. It could be residential, it could be commercial, it could be industrial, etc. Um, so we're gonna, you know, we're gonna first talk about what type of building we're at. We're gonna talk about its occupancy, and the last step is also talk about the size. We need to provide some approximate size of the building. All right, and when you're trying to determine the size of the building you're at. 
um, use something that you know the size of, right? I know, like, I use the size of a hockey rink, all right? We're talking, so for a hockey rink, it's two, it's, uh, the North American rink is 200 feet long, 85 feet wide. That gives me a general idea of how many feet I'm dealing with uh, in terms of the, uh, the house size, all right? The height, when we talk about the height of, this, of the building, we're going to talk about the number of stories, all right? So one, two, three, four stories, et cetera. Example of this type of transmission is going to be, uh, we have a type five residential structure, two stories, 100 by 60. All right. So again, you can see how we're building together, building this on scene report and how much information goes into it as we go. The next step, very, very important, right? We need to transmit to all, for all to hear the conditions that we are seeing on arrival at the fire scene. All right, we need to let crews know, are we responding to a working fire? Or is there some more investigation needed to determine what's going on in this situation? This can also help us provide some clues as to what stage the fire is in. Are we talking about incipient, growth, free burning, decay? What stage is the fire in? Early stage, late stage? Are we in free burn at this point in time and fully involved? Um, crews are going to now be better prepared for what they are going to. Incoming units are going to hear that broadcast. They're going to be able to understand, do we need to quickly put on our SCBA and be ready to hit the ground running? Or is there going to be some more investigation before we can determine exactly what we're doing here? All right. So again, I'm going to do some, so from the photos we have here, if I'm arriving on scene, uh, let's start with number one. Basically, my transmission for the conditions on this one is going to be dispatch, nothing showing. That's all it is, straight up, nothing showing. If uh, I came to the second one, I might say we have a working fire, smoke showing from the roofs and eaves, possible structural involvement. Why am I saying structural involvement? I think if anyone has taken the, uh, you know, some of our strategies and tactics courses, team leader courses, uh, we do talk about reading smoke and you can read and you can see with the smoke here, uh, we do have some browns in it uh, and that can sometimes uh, indicate that what we have is uh, untreated wood products burning. All right, so that's usually going to be found in structural support uh, beams and things like that. So that's a good indicator right there that we have uh, structural involvement. But that's a good on scene, you know, and again, if you didn't say that we may have structural involvement, that's fine. But say you have a working fire and we have smoke showing from the roof and eaves, that's the bare minimum right there. All right, that gives us an idea of what we're dealing with. I'm here, I'm here in that. I know I'm going to a fire that I know I'm going to a fire that's really going. And it's gotten into the roof area, and this is going to be a pain in the butt. So if I if I'm arriving on scene to the final one, basically I'm going to uh, my transmission will sound something like we have a working fire, smoke and flame showing from the attic area, alpha side. All right, we want to use our geographical designations that we know, Alpha, Bravo, Charlie, Delta, to, to let dispatch know exactly where the, the fire is. And again, I, un, I can hear this coming in, other incoming crews hear this coming in, they're going to have a sense, and you're painting a picture for what they're, on, uh, what they're arriving to. So if we're dealing with a working fire, the next step that we need to do is determine what strategic or operational mode we're gonna use at the outset to get control of that fire, all right? We have three choices. I have two of them on the screen here. And the third one is really not a choice that you make in terms of uh, that you, sorry. And the third one is not a, a choice that you make uh, in the initial stages. It's something that you decide on later. What happened to that? There it is. So basically, we have three choices. And the, and the first one would be defensive, right? It, what defensive means is exterior fire control. We are hitting it hard from the yard, right? Uh, surround and drown. You might hear those, those kind of terms, right? Um, this is used when the fire conditions are too dangerous to, and there are too many unknowns to, send it, to even consider sending in an interior attack team. All right, it can, it can also be done out of an abundance of caution. We know that we have everybody out of the building. What's the point of rushing into it to start with, right? Uh, the, other one, the, the other one that I have on the screen here is offensive, right? And that typically means we're talking interior fire control at that point in time. This is uh, used when it is safe enough to send firefighters into the structure to get, gain control of that fire. Um, it's not often we're gonna start in this mode, in the offensive mode. 
uh, what we could do is start on defensive and then go to what's called the third choice, transitional. Uh, transitional attack is a brief exterior attack, often using penciling from the exterior. So for those of you who've taken, you know, fire streams, hoses and appliances and, uh, and fire control, you understand about penciling. Um, so again, brief exterior fire attack, and then we're going to gain some control of that fire, and then we're going to send in teams inside the structure. All right. So, so I'll show you at the end, and I'll incorporate all of this into one, uh, one big transmission, just to show you how it's all going to sound at the end of the day. So the final step in the initial on-scene uh, 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 report is uh, to inform dispatch what your initial actions are going to be, all right? So there are a lot of options in this, right? I'm jumping out of the truck. I've given them all of this information already, you know, in terms of, <laughs> of uh, you know, we're on scene, we've got the correct address, we've got the building type and occupancy, building size, um, um, description of the conditions and our initial strategic or operational mode. Now, what am I going to be doing? Some options for, for this component would be, I'm going mobile to investigate, right? This means I'm gonna be looking for some more information, conducting a 360 size up, speaking to witnesses, things like that. Um, another thing you could say is I'm initiating a 360 size up. So just let them know, I am now going to be traveling around the building uh, and, and start my size up. Uh, you may also at that time say, uh, it may request additional resources. This is, uh, you know, what are my needs? I might need some extra resources. This fire is too big for us to handle. Let's get mutual aid rolling. Do we have RCMP coming? How about BCAS? What about everything else? And we'll talk about some of those considerations later. Um, you might uh, also say, well, based on the size of this, I'm bringing in so many resources, maybe I'm going to be setting up a level two staging area. You can let, uh, you know, and if you know that right at the, at the hop, let dispatch know so that the incoming crews are going to hear that and make sure that dispatch is then passing that message along to the mutual aid partners. You might also mention if there is a command post location. Often we're going to do this on the bumper of a command vehicle or some other, uh, some other apparatus at the scene. So now we've gone through all those steps. We're going to put it together into one complete transmission. And I've got two different examples here on the screen. And I'm going to use these examples to, to just give you an example of, uh, to just show you what, uh, what a transmission might sound like if we're arriving on scene at either of these two situations. All right. So again, when we're doing our, when we're, when we're doing our uh, communications with dispatch, we should all use our proper radio etiquette and proper radio uh, conduct, which is using the hey, you, it's me. So in this case, it would be, you know, Eagle Bay Dispatch from Eagle Bay Engine 1. Hey, you, Eagle Bay Dispatch from Eagle Bay Engine 1. Wait for the transmission to come back from dispatch. Go ahead, Eagle Bay Engine 1. Dispatch, you can mark us on scene. I'm confirming the address is 1234 Main Street. Eagle Bay Firefighter 403 Assuming Command. We'll call this Eagle Bay Command. Uh, we have a type five residential structure, approximately 40 by 30, single story, nothing showing at this time. I'm going mobile to investigate. All right, that can be a mouthful, uh, but you can see it's actually not that long of a transmission, but a lot of information jam packed into it, right? A lot of information that's important for not just for the, for, uh, the incoming crews that we've been talking about, but for that official log as, for, as well, that official record. And not least of all, myself on my way in, do I, now I know, okay, nothing showing, I'm likely gonna turn my lights and sirens off and respond routine to the scene, if not turn around after a, you know, depending on what uh, further information comes once they've gone mobile to investigate. Uh, likely I'll keep traveling until I get confirmation that there's nothing there, all right? Now that stands in contrast to what we have if we arrive on scene uh, to what you have on the slide on the picture on the right. All right, a little bit of a different situation, obviously, but the but the but the report itself doesn't change that much, right? Again, we go Eagle Bay Dispatch from engine from Eagle Bay Engine One. Go hey, go ahead, Eagle Bay Engine One. Dispatch, you can mark us on scene. New address one two three six Main Street. Eagle Bay Firefighter four zero three Assuming Command. We'll call this Main Street Command. We have a type five residential structure, approximately 80 by 32 stories. We have a working fire with visible smoke and flames on both floors, Alpha Bravo. I'll be going, uh, we'll be going defensive, uh, requesting mutual aid support from Shoe Swap Fire Department. Level two staging will be set up at the Eagle Bay Fire Hall. 
all right, again, if I got all, if, if you know, that all came to me right at once, I'd actually be pretty surprised. It's not likely where it's not often that that level two staging is going to come to you. But if it does, and if it's something you know you're going to need because we've got a bigger uh, thing we're dealing with, why not set it up? But every part of that, again, went through everything we just went through, right? We started off, we basically said we were on scene. We, we gave them a new address. We found out the address that we were given wasn't accurate. We assumed command, we named the command. We told them the building type, size, occupancy. Uh, we told them the conditions upon arrival. We talked about our strategic operational mode and we told them what our actions were and what our needs were going forward. All in that one communication. This communication can be, again, broken down into two parts. And sometimes with dispatch, it's not a bad idea to break up longer transmission into smaller bits. Uh, it also gives you a time to collect your thoughts, right? If you don't do it perfectly, and if you trip on the word, like if, if something doesn't come out exactly right, don't swear on the air, but we all make mistakes. Do the best you can at it and practice at it. Uh, I did give you guys, you know, a handout that came with this as well, and use that handout, take a look at it, practice with it, get used to that, and practice these on-scene reports, because these on-scene reports are vital, and again, they're being overlooked quite often, and we need to start working on them and getting them, you know, a little bit tighter so that uh, we've got better records, and, uh, and so that we're all informed to what we're going to. Okay, now we're on scene. We've made our first radio transmission to dispatch. It's going to be time for us, as the uh, after assuming command, to do a 360 uh, size up of the structure. All right, we need to see all sides of the structure to get a better picture of what we're dealing with. Uh, there might be something going around on the Charlie side that we can't see that really impacts what you know what's going uh, our our understanding of what's going on in this fire. All right, there may be conditions present on the other sides that will change our strategy, might change the way we decide we're going to address this situation. All right, we can do part of the size up right from the moment we're driving up on scene as well. We're looking at it, we're taking a look, and if we come around and we do, you know, we were able to come alongside of a, a residence, you know, if we have, let's say, a residence right here, if you're driving, you can see the back of the structure if you're coming this way. You now see one side, you come back and turn on the street here and you can see the other side of the structure. You've just seen three sides of the structure without even getting out of your vehicle, right? So if you can do it in, in the cab, we're always taking in that information. But again, we still need to get out, we still need to walk around and we still need to do a proper 360 of that structure. So part of that 360 is going to be speaking with the owner or the occupants if they're around, right? The building owner and the building occupants are valuable sources of information, right? They can have information on all sorts of things, right? They can tell you where and how the fire started. Where is it? You know, where is the seat of the fire? Um, they can tell you very important information on the building layout. They can tell you if they have any information on missed, missing or trapped people inside the uh, structure and maybe their possible location, where can we find them? Uh, they can tell you where to find utility shutoffs, right? Where, where, how do I shut off the gas? Where's, you know, where's, the, uh, where's the breaker box inside? Um, they can also tell you if there's other hazards at the scene. Oh yeah, by the way, I'm storing a whole bunch of propane tanks down in the, in the, in the basement. Hope that's not a problem. You know, that, that kind of thing, vital information for, the, for our safety and uh, for the way that we come up with our plan, all right? So after speaking with the building owner, we go do our size up, we're gonna wanna have the command board with us while we do it, all right? So again, the command board, many of us on this call, I'm sure are very, very familiar with it. Some of you may be less so familiar with it, but a quick little just outline of it. We have on the left-hand side, uh, is basically one side of the board, and that uh, and that is the side of the board that we use for our incident action plan and develop our plan for how we're dealing with the situation. The picture on the right of your screen uh, is a photo from the other side of the board, and that is the side of the board that we use to keep accountability of the members at the scene. This is how we track the movement of members and 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 what we've tasked them with, where they are, who they are uh, at, at a fire scene. So the big part that we're gonna use on that board while we're doing our 360 is gonna be that side that had the incident action plan, right? 
So this 360 is going to help us put together the information we need for our incident action plan. All right. Um, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to begin by figuring out what are the problems we're dealing with here. So I blew up that one section, you know, just at the top there, you can see uh, of the of the board. And I blew that up just so you can get a better look at what it says. Um, because really, this is the part of the board where our plan comes together. All right. <laughs> so we the first step on this board is to identify the problems we're facing. All right, so you see on the left-hand side there, we have our problems, think. So we need to think, what, what are we dealing with here, right? Is there fire or flame present, right? Uh, how about, uh, do we have uh, smoke, heat, gases, are they present? How about occupants? Are there any occupants inside the building? Uh, how many, where are they? Uh, are there any exposures that we need to, to protect? What about the building construction? You know what type, and so there I put a number five. You can see um, again. This is what I'm going to be doing as I'm going around as an incident commander. If I'm the first arriving officer, I'm going to be saying, "Do we have fire? Yes, I see flames." It, and it's as easy as a check mark for these things, right? You can the bottom of the board there. You see is nice and wide open and nice and nothing there. That's a great place to make any notes that you need to have. You can also use it to do, to draw yourself a, a little diagram of the of the building from you know from the basically like a top view, uh, show the Alpha Charlie uh, Alpha Bravo Charlie Delta sides and what you find on each of them. Identify here's where the utilities are. Here's where other things. I don't tend to use it for that. I use it more for notes. But again, whatever works for you, I totally you know go for it. So then we're gonna. Also keep going and say, are there any additional hazards that we need to be aware of? Uh, how about any concerns regarding access to the structure? We also left a couple of blank spaces there, as you can see. Is there anything else, right? Is there something else you came across that maybe you want to have as, as, uh, and have a special team that needs to maybe deal with that uh, situation? So again, now we've kind of figured out our problems. We've got to better handle on what we're dealing with here, all right? Before we come up with a plan on how to deal with it, we, we need to conduct what's called a risk-benefit analysis. We need to determine how, what level of risk am I willing to assume to deal with this situation, all right? We need to read the conditions of the building. And this little chart here, and I do have copies of it that I can send, uh, I'll send out to the fire departments tomorrow. Um, I find it a really handy little chart. And the chart, if you look at the top, it goes through, you know, basically the color codes that you might have, uh, you know, and uh, based on the fire conditions that you're seeing, right? So you can see one, uh, basically we've got nothing showing to some small, you know, some small smoke starting to come out. Uh, we got more smoke coming as it gets into the yellow and red, we need, the, the danger level goes up. We need to adjust our, our strategies according until we get right to the bottom where we've arrived at a parking lot, all right? Um, so again, we're trying to read the building condition. If we're looking at something that's like, so when you're you looking at the chart below, if we have something that's high risk with a low probability of success, no question, right? We're looking at defensive operations only. The other side of the coin is the high probability of success and low risk, we're into, into you know, we can go inside, figure things out, much less danger to us. And then usually things are going to fall somewhere else in this scale, right? We might have a high probability of success, but a high risk. Um, and again, it says here, initiate options of operations only with confirmation of realistic potential to save lives. And again, even in that situation with a realistic potential to save lives, you really have to think, you know, what risk you're putting your firefighters at in that situation. So, so again, this is a great little chart, you know, it kind of just visualizes what we always try to talk about and, and a, a, you know, it's said at a number of courses and it, and it bears repeating here as well. You know, we will risk a lot, our, we will risk our lives quite a lot to save a savable life, right? We will risk our lives a little in a highly calculated manner to save a savable property and we will not risk our lives at all for what is already lost and that includes people or property. All right, so we don't put our firefighters into danger to save what's already lost. If we've got a fully involved structure fire, there is nothing that's going to save that house. It is coming down. I, what is the point? Is there a possibility of a savable life in a fully involved structure fire? Is anybody going to find a space to live? Unlikely. All the oxygen is being consumed in that room. 
and toxic toxic smoking gases are everywhere, not to mention the heat. Uh, so again, you really have to make that, a, is there actually something here to save? Is there actually something here that we can do about this, you know, in terms of saving life? Or is this something where we just need, we need to make sure that it doesn't get any bigger and, and, uh, and, and prevent it from progressing from that stage? So we talked about uh, you know the one the side of the command board that had uh, the incident action plan on it. So we did our problems, our thinking portion. Now we're getting into the strategic goals. What are we trying to achieve here? Right. It's time to decide how we're going to deal with these problems that we now have figured out are there. Right. And what we use uh, to to help us determine our strategic goals, we use the acronym RECOVS. All right, and it doesn't roll off the tongue. It's not a great acronym, but it's one that's been used for a long time. All right, so just re again, remember the RECOVS. And this is actually included on all of these rescue exposures, confinement, extinguishment, overhaul, ventilation, salvage. All of these strategic goals are on the other side of your incident action, of your, of your accountability board. All right, so your command board, flip it over, Right there, you'll see all of these all of these topics not written out in the RECOVS necessarily, but all of them will be there, and I think RIT is on there as well. All right. So again, this is this this uh, acronym has been used by fire departments for many years to set out the recommended priorities and uh, that help us accomplish the goals and mitigate the problems that we're being faced with. All right, and this is about the order. So think about it. The first thing we're worried about is going to be rescue. We want to save lives. That's the first thing. That's why they put it at the top, right? Next thing we're going to worry about is we don't want it to get anywhere else. So exposures, we want to prevent it from getting bigger. We want to try and confine it, right, to where it's at and, and not travel further in the building if we can. We're going to try and go with, you know, and then we're going to go for extinguishment, full overhaul. Uh, and ventilation and salvage, as you can see with the RECOVS, there's a little hyphen there. And again, salvage is always uh, an action of opportunity. We do it when we can. And ventilation needs to work itself into those uh, much, much earlier. I would actually probably have put it at the very beginning, but uh, everyone probably knows my feelings on ventilation right now, which I love it. Um, just uh, something to keep in mind, though, just because an item is a priority does not mean it's necessarily the first task to be completed. Right. Uh, think about this. If, can we send a rescue team in if we don't have control of the fire yet? Am I going to send a search team in and not have an attack team already in there? The answer is no. We need to have some control over that. We're not just going to send a team in and searching around a building when we have a fire going out of control. That needs to be addressed. Right. Pretty straightforward on that. How about, you know, so we need to send in an attack team. Right. But do we want to send that attack team in without a vent fan at their back? Probably not. Again, if we've if we've you know paid attention at our training, uh, a fire attack with a ventil with a with ventilation already put in place is much more effective when done properly. All right. So now let's say we have ventilation. Uh, we have the ventilation set up. All right, great. <clears throat> now we can send in the attack team. Great. So now we've got control of the fire again. Great. Now we can send the search team in. No, because we need to have a rapid intervention team established before we can send a second team into the building. That is a work safe requirement, right? So now we've got a vent fan, we've got a vent team, we've got a vent team going. We sent the attack team in. I've now established a RIT team. Now I've established a, a RIT team. Can I send my search team into the building to red do the rescue? Yes. So you see how rescue is my number one priority. But in this scenario I just went through, it was the third action or the fourth action, I guess, after ventilation, attack team, RIT team, now I can do my, my search team. All right. All of those needed to be in place before I can even get people into that building to try and do that rescue, right? <clears throat> You'll often find that your tasks will fall into the following order if there's a rescue required. All right, it's going to be that ventilation, fire attack, rapid intervention team search. That is how you're going to have to set them up. First thing I need to do is get a vent team going, get that, you know, get that, get, get fresher air in there. If we have survived, you know, people surviving in there, we have survivable spaces. Why not try to get them fresh air? And why not use the vent fan to try and cool the space and, and give them, uh, give a bit better view for our firefighters looking for them, right? Fire attack. 
anytime we start controlling the fire, as long as we're not creating too much steam when we're in there by using, you know, fog patterns and something dumb like that, um, we're going to provide, we're going to make better conditions inside. And the vent fan is now going to take that, uh, that steam out of the building too. Rapid intervention teams for our safety, that doesn't ever change. And search team, again, they're the next ones to go. All right, we're going to get into a bit more detail on this topic, and and again, and when if when you take the strategies and tactics course, when you take your live fire three course, and when you take the team leader course, um, we get these boards in your hand a lot more. You'll get to play with them, and uh, and you'll kind of see how it works in tabletop settings. And I and I encourage you, those of you who are who have taken those courses, to pass that kind of information along. Do tabletops at your hall, uh, and if anybody does want, you know, a couple buildings um, to uh, to practice their tabletops, get in touch with me. I have those resources available. All right, so now we've done our, you know, we figured out our problems, we've done our strategies. Now, I, and, and so here I am, and you can see on the, on the slide here, this is what, once we've got, this is what your final kind of stage is in your incident action plan, but other than putting it into motion, right? When you're developing that plan. So we've got our problems, right? I, I check the boxes. Yes, I've got fire. I've got smoke and heat and gases. I've got occupants. I've got exposures. My building construction is five. Kind of stopped at that point in time, right? Um, so now it's time to come up with the place and uh, come up with my strategies. And with the strategies, like we talked about, right? Well, you know, yeah, I've got occupants. All right. But again, what do we need to do before that? Well, you can see the order that I put them in. And this is the order that you have as well on your command board. You can see one, two, three, four, five. I've, they're actually in order on your command board already, right? Uh, in, in the order that, you know, when there's a rescue operation that needs to be done, this is a pretty straightforward order you're going to be doing things in, right? So now I've prioritized because I know I need my ventilation before I can send in a search team. I need my confinement before I can send in, a, you know, a search team. I need my writ before I can send in the search team. Now I can send in my search team. Great. I've done rescue, right? But at the same time, I've already taken care of confinement. I've already taken care of a couple of the other RECOVS, right? So I've got that in order. Now, directly beside it, we're into the tactics area. Right, and what are the tactics that I'm going to use? Basically, what type of teams do I need to uh, to to implement the strategies that I've said I need? I said I needed ventilation. That was my first thing I needed. All right, so there, I've got a number one. Over here, I've got a vent team. All right, so my tactic is going to be I'm going to have a vent team, and they're going to vent from Alpha to Charlie. That's what that means on there. there. Does everyone see that? My second thing I said I needed, I need to confine, confine that fire. I needed to have somebody on that fire so that I can put that, so, you know, before I can put a search team in above it. Okay, well, that, how you can find a fire? You can find it with an attack team. So I use that, I, I just use that shortened form, ATT for attack team. I'm gonna have the attack team enter alpha and they're gonna go to Charlie first floor to address the fire. That's what this, the, that's what all this means here. Again, we're not getting too deep down the rabbit hole, but just so you can kind of get a sense of what these mean, I'm going to go through these ones here. I need, before I can put my search team in, I need a rapid intervention team. What is, you know, what kind of team would do rapid intervention? Well, a rapid intervention team. So I call it RIT. Where am I going to put my RIT team? They're going to stay on the exterior of the structure. And in this case, since I have an attack team uh, at the fire on the Charlie side, I'm going to place them over on the Charlie side. That, that way, they're closest to that attack team if anything were to go bad, right? Now we're into rescue, all right? What, who does a rescue? Call it a search team. You could call them search. You can call them primary search, however you want to call them. Uh, I have them down here as primary search, and that's going to be alpha. And I'm going to have that primary search team go in the alpha door and proceed to the second floor Charlie, which is where I've been told we're going to find grandma. Right, so they're going to go as fast as they can to the place where it's most likely to find the, the occupant. And finally, I do have on here. I did take it down to exposures. I'm going to have an exposure team to deal with those exposures, and I'm going to put them on the delta side exterior. That's where I found a propane tank. All right. So again, you can see there's a lot to building this board, but take these courses. You're going to get a lot more experience in it, and I think, uh, and you'll see how how really the the same kind. It's very it's like a rhythm. They 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 all work very similar the same way. All right. Something else I want you to pay attention to here as well is you know for an interior attack with a rescue, 
like we have in the scenario that we talked about here, um, we needed a lot of personnel. All right. And let's just think about that for a second. We need to do a search in, in, in a structure. We need to make a rescue. How many people are we going to need? All right. Let's just do the math. First, I need an incident commander. Of course, that's me. All right, I'm the incident commander. Great. Okay, we need a pump operator. I need somebody to send me water. Great, that's two people I need right there. I need a vent team. Let's say two to three people. Let's go on the low side. We'll call it two. We're up to four. All right, now I need an attack team. I'm not going to send in an attack team with less than three people unless it's like a really dire city, unless it's a, a very small thing. So I'm going to say a three-person attack team. All right, now we're up to seven. Now I need a RIT team, two-person RIT team. Now we're up to nine. Primary search team, that's three more. Now I'm up to 12. All right, that's 12 members trained with, in, with basically, you need at least five of those members to have team leader or higher, and you need six members with interior operations training or higher. Uh, on top of those five, uh, on top of those five that you have with team leader training. All right. And this is the number before we even start considering an exposure team, firefighter rehab, water shuttling, all the other things that happen on fire scenes. So you can see how quickly in a situation like this, our resources are going to be taxed very quickly. All right. Which is why having mutual aid on scene en route is so vital. It's so important. Make sure you have them rolling. We can always stand them down. Okay, now it's time to put that plan into motion. All right, we've got our plan. You can see on the right of this slide, we've got that plan that we just talked about. I went through what it all meant. We've got a vent team, uh, they're venting from Alpha to Charlie. Attack team is going in the Alpha, going to the Charlie first floor to attack the fire. My RIT team is gonna be stationed at the Charlie exterior. My primary search team is entering Alpha, also with the fan at their back and going up to the second floor, Charlie. And then we have an exposure team on the Delta exterior. All right, now I start putting it on my board and you can see how I've assigned it on my board. Each one of these tags that are on the board, so these represent the accountability tags that you can see up here. And they're color coded with a, you know, a little bit of an idea on what we need for training levels to be able to make this work. I put, you know, I put, the incident commander needs to be a team leader or higher, right? You need to have that training. Safety officer, team leader or higher. Um, in my staging area, I've got a couple of interiors, a couple of, uh, a couple of uh, exteriors. My attack team, I've got one team leader and I've got two interior firefighters. My vent team, I've got one team leader and one interior firefighter. My RIT team, same thing. My, <laughs> and uh, my search team, same, uh, you know, same thing. One, uh, one team leader, two interior. My uh, exposure team, I have to have a team leader for that team too. Now I have also an exterior operations firefighter with them, right? Because we're outside the structure. So, and the way I build, and then, so the way we build it here is I take my, I have my vent team here. I put them on my board. I take my two members. I call them the vent team. What are they doing? Where are they venting? They're venting from Alpha to Charlie. Who are they? They're two members from Eagle Bay Fire Department. And that's what this means down here. Two times EB, right? You can you use the, obviously your own fire department, White Lake, Shoe Swap, wherever you are. Um, and and denote it that way. It might be two. It might be one member from Eagle Bay and one member from Shoe Swap. Well, you need to make sure that you do you have that down there too. And this comes into play if you do a roll call later on. I have my attack team here. Basically, where are they going? In from Alpha, going to Charlie first. And who are they? Three firefighters from Eagle Bay. All right. Same thing. Rit. They're going to be stations at the Charlie exterior. They are two firefighters from Eagle Bay. So you see how I've set up my board here. Now I have my accountability set up. My incident action plan is on the other side. I have my manning pool ready to go. I know my safety officer is. I can take notes on the engines that I have on scene and all the other information. That is my incident action plan, right? We've assigned the tasks uh, to the available members in the manning pool, right? We, we're maintaining accountability as we go. One other thing we need to do, we need to constantly monitor for changing conditions. We've done one 360 size up. We've made our incident action plan. I'm going to go and do another size up after I get all the balls in motion, right? And I'm going to do regular 360s uh, as we're going, right? I remember going to a mill fire in Malacqua. I had to do about six laps around this bloody mill in the middle of winter, post hole and around it. I hated it, but it's part of the job. We, you can't get a sense of what's going on and the problems you're facing unless you can put eyes on it and, and know where and know if there's something you're missing. All right. 
as we're doing this, as we're doing these regular 360s, we're also keeping in mind things like, you know, the plan I put in place, is it working, right? Does the incident action plan need to be modified in any way, right? One good way of knowing that when you're talking about extinguishing a fire is steam generation. Are we making, you know, are we making steam? Are we hitting the fire effectively, right? If it's about, if it's about, you know, trying to find somebody, is that team being successful looking in the location that they're looking? Maybe we need to find more information or try to find a look in a different location or try a different technique. All right, so is our plan working? If it's not working, you know, maybe as soon as I started ventilating, the fire blew out of control. Okay, maybe that's something that tells me I need to come up with a different plan of attack for that ventilation strategy. Maybe there's something missing that I that I need to take another look at. All right, constantly evaluate your plan. You don't, this isn't a set it or forget it. This is going to be constantly evolving. As the situation changes, as we get a good handle on the situation, we move into things like overhaul and having to consider that for full extinguishment. Um, and as we're going, always thinking about salvage as well, right? But always, always evaluating, constantly thinking about it. Uh, that doesn't mean you necessarily always have to be doing laps and laps and laps around the building. I, I prefer an incident commander to be findable too, right? I, I want to be able to find this person. If I'm going to go on a 360 around a mill, I'm going to tell everybody I'm doing it. And to tell you the truth, in that mill one, I wasn't the incident commander. I was there helping. So I, and the incident commander stayed at the command post and I went and did the 360s for them, reported back on the conditions I saw. Again, I have the ability in the, the, to read that stuff. If you're going to send somebody out to do your 360s, make sure that they know what they're looking at. Okay, now we're going to talk about some of the other considerations that come into, in, into play in our role as the first arriving officer as incident commander, right? Um, communication. Communications are critical to an effective response, right? Um, so communications with teams, do we have enough, you know, do we have enough portable radios? Are they working? Um, are we passing along important information? Um, are they checking in with incident command and providing important information to us, right? We want to hear that, that, that communication come back as well. Um, and we want to also make sure that there's no unnecessary chatter going on on the radios, right? Especially you're working, you're at a working fire. There shouldn't be any talk about, hey, you're going to Bob's barbecue next week. No, we're talking fire stuff. There's nothing, uh, you know, there's nothing unnecessary. We need to make sure that they're effective, that, uh, that only necessary communications are being made. All right. We also need to communicate with fire dispatch, right? And this includes benchmarks. And again, I can't say this word enough. This is a big thing for me is, is, is getting those benchmarks. And when I talk about benchmarks, I'm talking about things like on scene, uh, writ established. I've got my rapid intervention team established. If I say writ established, they have a timestamp on when I set up writ. Uh, teams entering a building, I want to know that, right? And if a team is entering a building, uh, BC ambulance on scene. Another big one that we keep missing sometimes is, is, is letting dispatch know when the fire is struck. And when I say struck, it means we've got it knocked down under control and likely just need to go in to do an overhaul for final extinguishment. All right, so letting, uh, letting dispatch know all of these things, now it's a part of the official record. Now, if there's any questions that come up after the fact, if there's anything that ever uh, that uh, ever gets questioned, possibly things go to court. And I can tell you, I've been to court before for structure fires. So having those benchmarks included in the dispatch log can be an assist to us in terms of making sure that the, that we have a record of doing our job out there, all right, and doing our job properly out there, all right. Do not overlook benchmarks. Do not overlook that communication with dispatch, all right. Another consideration we want to take in uh, that we want to take in is is we need to keep in mind ICS principles, and we need to adjust our incident action plan accordingly. All right. So when we're talking about ICS principles, I'm talking about those three topics on the board there specifically: span of control, chain of command, unity of command. All right. And again, what do we talk about when we're talking about span of control? What we mean there is uh, span of control is the maximum number that of subordinates that a person can oversee. If you remember your ICS training, that number is typically three to seven, right? Five is around the ideal. 
If the span of control is going to exceed seven, you need to consider breaking down your, stru your ICS structure into maybe further into things like groups, divisions, task force, strike teams. This gets into some advanced stuff. And again, if it's a situation where you might want to have your uh, highest ranking officer helping you out to, to, to make that out, all right? To make that up. And if I'm there, I can definitely assist in making sure that we can break down an ICS structure and you guys are going to get great experience and we're going to do it awesome. All right. Chain of command. What we're talking about there is each firefighter needs to know who they answer to. All right. If you're going to make a team, you need to let it be very clear on this is my team. This is your team leader. You guys report to them. Team leader, you report to me. Right. Those are the kind of things you need. So I've got a, you know, a sample of, of the chain of command and an org chart at the bottom of this slide here. Uh, the attack team, uh, the team leader is going to report to the incident commander. All of the team members are going to report to the attack team leader. Right? Same with the search team. Only the team leaders from each of those teams are going to communicate. Right, because if you think I'm gonna I'm gonna be as an incident commander is is or I'm gonna be able to take communications from all 12 of the people on that uh, on my org chart right now, no, it's not gonna be possible, right? And then the last one that I have up there is the unity of command. And unity of command is the concept that each subordinate is responsible to a single leader, right? So that person on the attack team isn't reporting to the attack team and the incident commander. They're reporting to the attack team leader, right? That's, that's it. They report to the attack team leader. They do not go up to incident command, all right? So you have one person that you respond to, that, that, you're, that you have to talk to, and one person only, all right? The attack team leader goes to the incident commander. Another consideration we need to uh, keep in mind is firefighter rehabilitation. I've got a great picture of one of our firefighters there. Uh, and so firefighter rehab is vitally important. BC Ambulance, we're very lucky. BC Ambulance performs the service for us whenever they're available. When they come to scene, they do a great job. Uh, they're going to do our medical monitoring, uh, vital sign, you know, make sure our vitals are good. They're going to, you know, they're, and we're going to have a chance to get, you know, we, we have our own water and snacks and things like that. So we take care of that part of it. One thing to keep in mind, though, is that if BCAS is not available, it is still up to us to provide this service. We need to provide firefighter rehabilitation. This is a work safe BC requirement, all right? Rehab take, takes care of our firefighters and that's the most important job any incident commander has is taking care of your people, all right? So we need to re ensure rehab is being established. We need to make sure our people are cycling through rehab. If you need to talk to your team leaders and make sure that they're taking their regular break, that their team is taking the regular breaks, do it. But uh, don't overlook rehab. So another consideration, something that we can that we can have, uh, it's really a nice thing to have in our back pocket is that we have some resources with the emergency program. And for those of you who were able to attend the training when we had, and there's a slide with Kathy on it right there, but we had Kathy talking about emergency social services and neighbor, neighborhood emergency programs. Uh, we had Tom Hansen come on and talk about some of the resources uh, through, uh, through the emergency program as well. Um, and the emergency program has uh, basically, uh, they have, uh, they're able to assist us in managing the incident. They're there for us, right? Uh, we can do things like an EOC activation, emergency operations center activation. And maybe we need, you know, a large scale emergency. We might want to consider notifying the emergency program and request an EOC. Um, what the EOC does is it helps to assist in prioritizing. Uh, it can help in resource acquisition for us. So we're not trying to say, I need a bulldozer or something for, for something going on here. Let the emergency operations center staff do that for you. Right? Somebody else on the outside do that for you. Um, you know, uh, we need, oh man, we're going to need, you know, more ambulances down here. Let them like do some talking with dispatch as well and try to find some of the resources you're going to need. Um, they can help us uh, set up communication systems, like better communication systems, different kinds of communication systems. We have there's mobile, uh, you know, base stations that we have for radios. Uh, they can help in certain zones, um, and they can help in so many other areas. So you know, so they're there for us for that. An emergency operations center. Another thing the emergency program does that you heard about the uh, a couple of weeks ago was is emergency social services, right? Remember ESS, um, it's available to assist residents of, uh, that, uh, that were impacted by an emergency, by a structure fire in this case, um, helps provide them shelter, 
food, other necessities that they may need, uh, you know, before their insurance kicks in. Um, we can't lose sight of the fact that we do this job to help people, right? And ESS is an excellent resource to help us with this. Uh, another resource that the emergency program has is on the screen there, and that's the mobile operations unit, or MO, as we call it, all right? That truck that's up there, that's our mobile operations unit, and this can be deployed in any emergency if needed. It's a resource at the incident commander's uh, disposal if they request it. Something we don't use very often, but I do encourage you to, if you think there's a need for it, bring it out. It has resources for setting up mobile command posts. It can provide, it can also help help in the provision of rehab. I mean, it provides shelter and has water and things like that on board. It's not really set up for medical monitoring. So we're gonna have to have uh, our own equipment on hand to do that, all right? But, but inside of Mo, it's set up so that it has like long desks. We can bring chairs in there, make it into, basically a mobile emergency operations center with communications equipment and all sorts of other stuff. So think about it. If you think it's needed, let's make the call. And uh, for accessing the emergency program resources, that's as easy as contacting myself or, or Derek Sutherland. And uh, one of us will be able to, uh, to, to help you out with that. Another consideration is the outside agencies, all right? There's another, there, we work with numerous agencies uh, and, and uh, we can call these guys for assistance. They can call us for assistance if needed. Um, and we request it through dispatch. So remember, just call on them if you need them, right? Uh, in the, for the RCMP, they can do things like crowd control for us. We've got a lot of looky-loos and onlookers. If they're on scene, they can take care of that for you, right? Uh, if it's a suspicious fire, they may have a role to play in the investigation, right? Uh, if you're experiencing harassment or violence at a fire scene, the RCMP are the ones who we need there to help prevent that and to, and to, uh, and to, and to keep us safe. All right, and that has happened, and we've seen that happen on fire scenes before, where people have, you know, been the victims of harassment and violence on fire scenes. So the RCMP have a big role to play. Um, I almost put traffic control down in my notes, and I decided not to because, as we know, it's very unlikely they're going to end up doing traffic control unless that traffic control is parking their cruiser across the road to close it, which again might happen. Uh, middle one I've got there is the BC Wildfire Service again. Let them know of any wildfire. They have tons of resources, like they have manpower that they'll send for wildland firefighters, right? They have air support, all sorts of things that they can do. Um, and they're certainly going to be important, uh, you know, to make sure that it doesn't go beyond our capability to deal with it. BC Ambulance Service, we talked about for firefighter rehab. The primary duty there is going to be to transport injured personnel and injured civilians to, uh, to hospital and do pre-hospital medical care. Pretty straightforward for them. Uh, Fortis BC, they do natural gas. If you're in an area with propane, maybe it's cow gas or superior propane. And then BC Hydro, of course, they do the electrical utility shutoff. Um, one I don't have on here is MOTI or the Highways Contractor AIM. Uh, they, they can help with traffic control, highway closures, things like that. Um, you know, like with mutual aid, it's better to have the resources en route and to stand them down than it is to need them and have to wait longer because you didn't get them rolling early. All right, so let's get them en route, let's get them rolling, and then we can stand them down if we determine we don't need them anymore. Another thing that I wanted to talk about that we need to keep in consideration, and I put this in for myself a little bit because we need to do an origin and cause investigation at the end of every fire, all right? And so as an incident commander, something to keep in the back of your mind is that we need to do this origin and cause investigation. Um, it is, you know, the fire suppression activities, they lead to increased damage. We call it secondary damage. Um, and, and that negatively can impact the fire investigation. It can have a really disastrous impact on it. Uh, a lot of, you know, and I, I've said it before, and I know many of you have heard me say that, but the police call, uh, call us the scene destruction unit uh, very often because we destroy evidence like nobody's business. Uh, you go through there with your hoses while, you know, it looks like an army walk, walk through uh, some of our fire scenes. Um, our overhaul activities can increase the damage and compromise that evidence uh, that could be useful in a fire investigation, all right? So we need to consider our, the impact of our strategy and tactics on the investigation, but we should not 
uh, let it override everything, right? Fire suppression is our first priority. The investigation should not be the primary consideration in any situation here, okay? Our first thing is we need to control this fire. I don't give a damn if you're walking over evidence or whatever you need to do to get it out. You do what you can. But once we have get control of that and we start getting into the overall phases, that's where this origin and cause investigation come into, you know, choosing whether or not we move this, you know, this which might be evidence over to this area. You know, if you need to move something to to put it out and to ensure you have complete extinguishment, go for it 100%. If you're just moving something and I can tell you I've had a situation where, you know, I had a fire department go in and I'm I'm there, you know, I they did an amazing job, knocked down a fire in a hoarder house. It's so great. I was like absolutely impressed. One of the best fire attacks I've ever seen. And then I'm there, okay, time to do an origin and cause investigation, try to figure out what happened there. And I got a firefighter come out and go, I found what did it. I found the toaster that lit the fire, right? And he brought it out of the house and showed it to me and I'm like, Oh my God, where was it exactly, right? Now we've got to go back and put it back exactly where it was. And we found out afterwards, fortunate, well, I guess fortunately, but that was not the cause of the fire, right? Because the location that it was at, it really did make a big difference because we had a beautiful V pattern and where the toaster was, was nowhere near where the, where the location of the origin of the fire was. Um, of course, I'm not entirely sure of that because it was moved, but I was assured by the firefighter that he found it in the location there. And I believe we did eventually find and that the cause was cooking and that uh, uh, the homeowner had been cooking, I believe bacon and uh, ended up having a grease fire and found out very quickly that water is not the way to extinguish a grease fire. Um, so remember, if the tactics can be changed to minimize the damage, let's do that. But again, not our primary consideration, um, but just never move that investigation if you can. I mean, never move that evidence if you can. Don't bring it out to, to the fire investigator. Don't, don't say, hey, look what I found. Bring the, bring the investigator to what you're looking at. If you see something, coming in, you know, let your team leader know and pass it up the chain of command so that so that the investigator can come take a look at the evidence and uh, and do their job there. All right. And the final consideration I have for you from the command point of view is uh, critical incident stress management and chaplaincy. All right. We we need to keep in mind that we uh, that we need to protect the mental health of our members as well. Right. CSRD, we have uh, at the CSRD, we have a critical incident stress management team and a, a top notch chaplaincy team that can be called to the scene. All right. And this is something that we haven't utilized nearly enough, but something that please keep in the back of your mind, those of you who may find themselves in a command role. Our chaplaincy and SISM teams are made up of firefighters. These firefighters are trained in how to operate at an emergency scene, and they can come, and they're also trained in meant in uh, critical incident stress management, both chaplaincy and critical incident stress management team. All right. Types of scenes you might want to consider right away calling them to fatalities, right? People are going to react uh, and have, you know, negative, uh, negative reactions to that happening, obviously, right? Um, if we respond to a call um, to assist someone that we know, uh, now it's some, you know, might be a family member, it might be one of, you know, a neighbor that we know, uh, or somebody who used to be a neighbor or somebody that's, you know, in the Lions Club with us, whoever, that can have a negative impact on them too, and, and, and possibly might be a call for bringing in the SISM and chaplaincy team. Um, or if they experience violence or harassment at the scene. Uh, that might be a situation that can be tough to take for us, right? So think about that and any other situation. And this is by no means close to an exhaustive list on the uh, on on the different types of things that can affect our mental health. Um, but rem just remember, the member of these teams have been trained to recognize the early signs of mental distress. They can talk to members and help them cope right on the scene. They can recommend outside assistance, in including uh, critical incident stress management debriefing uh, with, a, with a trained psychologist and one-on-one -on -one counseling. Um, you know, and just remember, the chaplains are non-denominational. They can help with spiritual support. They have that ability, um, uh, but they can, all, they can do spiritual and mental uh, support. Um, and they're not going to impose uh, the spiritual side of it unless it's requested. All right, so remember these teams, think about these teams. Again, as an incident commander, our first responsibility is to our team. And that's not just the physical, but the mental health as well. All right. 
Well, folks, we've come to the end. I think it's pretty clear here that the first arriving officer has a big job, right? Whether you're currently an officer with your department um, that might find yourself in the command position more often, or if you're a new member working hard to learn all these skills about, you know, firefighting um, and, under, and understanding the, by understanding the role of the first arriving officer, you're going to be able to do your job much more effectively. Any of us can find ourselves in that role after a short time with our department. It's really vital that we incorporate the concepts that we've discussed today into a practice, uh, and, and we want to take, and we want to practice the role of taking uh, the role of the first arriving officer. All right, so that we're prepared to do that job when we're called upon to do it. I want to thank everyone for joining us, and I'm going to at this time stop the recording. And if anybody has any questions, we can go from there.